We turn for our scripture reading this evening to the gospel as recorded by Matthew, and we read in chapter 21. The gospel as recorded by Matthew, and we read in chapter 21 and from the verse 1. And when they, that is, Jesus and his disciples, drew nigh to Jerusalem and were come to Bethpage and to the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them away. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on, on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when Jesus was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said to them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were so displeased, and said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus said unto them, Yea, have ye never read, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou perfected praise? We'll end there at the verse 16. Now, shall we join our hearts together again in prayer? Shall we pray together? Our blessed Lord, we thank thee that again on this Sabbath day we find ourselves assembled together as a company of thy blood-bought and redeemed people. We thank thee again, our gracious God, for the great privilege that again is afforded unto us to meet in this manner. We thank thee, our Heavenly Father, for that earnest desire within our souls to congregate on the Lord's day amongst the Lord's people, to worship thee, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God. We know something of the yearnings of the psalmist when he said, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth our souls after thee, O thou living God. We thank thee, O God, that in coming into thy presence and amongst thy people, we know something of refreshing grace from past experience. But we come to thee this evening hour afresh and seek thy favour and thy goodness towards us, in that thou hast so ordained our affairs that we are able to gather. And we pray that thou shalt be pleased thyself to grant us to know something of the presence of God. Forbid it, O Lord, that ever we should come because it is the thing that we do. We do it out of habit or out of tradition. But we come, Lord, earnestly desiring to know something of the blessing of God upon us. We realize, our Heavenly Father, the vanity and the vexation of spirit in all that surrounds us and in all that the world seeks to offer to us. We see the deceitfulness of sin we see abundant evidence of the dissatisfaction despite all the clamorings and the cravings and the ambitions of men to attain unto that peace and tranquility that is afforded to the people of God. 
We bless thee, O God, that thou hast made it to be towards us as it is, in that thou hast set us right with thyself and caused thy face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. But, Lord, even though we have received bountifully at thine hand, we still hunger and thirst after righteousness and to know something of the reality of being in the presence of the living God. We read in the scriptures of occasions when men were unable to minister because of the reality of the presence of God. We read in the history books of the Christian church of similar experiences with our fathers of old. And, O God, we would dare to come before thee this evening hour and ask of thee to grant us to know something of such a presence as that, where the mouths of men might be stopped, and all would be silent before thee, as we adore and as we praise from the depths of our beings the reality of knowing that God the Lord is in the midst of his people, the Shekinah glory, having come down and presenced himself with his people. To that end, we pray that through the understanding of thy truth, we might be drawn out after thee, thou living God, yearning more and more to know something of his presence and of his goodness towards us. Again, we thank thee for the scriptures, and we pray, Lord, that as we seek to meditate upon them again this evening hour, it shall please thee by thy divine spirit to open up the sacred pages to us and make them real. We remind ourselves of the experience of those men of old as thou didst minister to them on the wayside. Their hearts did burn within them. And, O oh God, we long to know something of hearts that burn and yearn and long to know something more of the glories and the splendor of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. To this end wilt thou be our portion and be our strength. We commend each other to thee. Thou knowest the various circumstances in life's journey from which we come. Thou knowest the secrets of our hearts. Thou knowest the anxieties, perhaps, that play upon our minds. Thou knowest those things that perhaps are before us in the coming week, which perplex us and cause us anxiety. O oh God, thou we are told at the shepherd and the bishop of our souls. Give us grace to trust thee. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. As we remember ourselves, we remember those who are absent from us, those perhaps who are laid aside and unable to be in the midst of thy people as much as they would long to do. Wilt thou draw near to them and minister grace sufficient towards their needs. And our families and those who are near and dear to us, who still as of yet cause us concern and anxiety when we think of their eternal destiny, still strangers to the covenants of promise, to the commonwealth of Israel, without God and without hope in this world. O oh God, give to us grace to persevere in praying and being wise in our dealings with them, that they like us might come to rejoice in Jesus Christ, our Lord and our God. And Lord, we thank thee for the continuance of thy mercies to us. We pray tonight for those that seek to defend the causes of peace in our world. We think of all those that serve thee in our armed forces in this land and in other nations, and those that seek to minister in thy name unto them. As we think, as we have done, and it's been brought forcefully home to us during the course of the past week, the terrible atrocities that took place exactly 100 years ago, we see the futility and the emptiness of men in their strivings. And, O oh God, we long that him who is described as the Prince of Peace might yet descend into our midst and bring to pass his purposes and his will, that men and women might realize and understand that alone it is through him that men can li live in peace and in concord. Until that day doth dawn and shadows flee away as thy people, we yearn and we long to know the wisdom of heaven upon us, enabling us to honor thee in all things. And so our blessed God and Saviour, we thank thee tonight for the Church of Jesus Christ. We thank thee that throughout the length and breadth of this land of ours and in other nations of the world, there will be those who faithfully will proclaim the unsearchable riches of Christ. O oh God, descend in the plenitude of thy grace upon every 
faithful ambassador of the gospel. May they know thine hand upon them for good. The anointing of the Spirit be in their portion, that men and women in their sin might turn from the paths and darkness of its ways to the glorious light and liberty of the sons of God. To that end, we commend each other to thee, asking thee afresh to pardon us of our sin and to love us freely. For Jesus' sake. Amen. I am grateful for the opportunity of uh, being with you here again today. I remember coming here as a small boy in shorts. And uh, to think now I'm invited to preach here is a great honour, and I appreciate your fellowship in the gospel. History. In recent days, we have seen it made. And in years to come, no doubt, students of politics will get PhDs on Bretex. Uh, I'm a bit of a rascal, you know. And uh, on that Friday morning after the result, I walked into the office singing uh, Rule Britannia. And I was met with a wall of silence. I only did it to wind them up because they were all for staying within the common. How I voted, I'm not telling you but I did vote. But we have seen in recent days history being made and uh, the situation that confronts us at this point in time is frightening the hearts of very many people. But again, during the course of this past week, we have seen history remembered when we were reminded on Friday of this week of those Ter that terrible day, exactly 100 years ago, when in excess of 19,000 men were slaughtered in a day. So history is extremely important. But I want to suggest to you this evening that what we have in Matthew chapter 21 is an account that tells us of the beginning of the greatest week in the history of mankind. Because here in Matthew chapter 21, we have the account given to us of the entrance of our Lord and Saviour into Jerusalem for the very last time while it was here upon earth. He was entering that city to die. He knew what his lot was, he knew why he was going there, and he went there with a determination and a will to fulfil the demands of a righteous God. But the fascinating thing about what we are told in this chapter is to be found in the verse 10, where we are told this, and when Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? Now that is something difficult to comprehend and to grasp. A whole city asking exactly the same question. Now when we read the scriptures we discover that this lies at the very heart of what the Christian church believes, what lies at the very heart of the Christian gospel because the answer that is given to this question is the most significant and the most important answer that any man or any woman will ever give to any question at all. It is a question that was frequently asked during the, during the life of our Lord and at other times in the scriptures. You remember that earlier in St. Matthew's Gospel in chapter 8, we have an account there of his disciples with him in a boat in the midst of a storm. He's fast asleep. They're experienced fishermen. But they wake him from his sleep and they tell him, Master, we perish. And simply by words, the storm is calm. And they turned in amazement, one to the other. And they said, what manner of man is this that wins and that waves obey him? It was a question that Jesus himself, only uh, quite soon before this, had posed to his own disciples. He said, you move amongst the people after I've passed on. What do they say about me? Who do they say that I am? And they give him a variety of answers. 
And then he turns to them, he says, but who do you say that I am? Peter answers the question for them, of course. It is a question that was asked during the years of the early church. You remember that account in in the 8th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles when Philip is moved by God to go down into a desert place and he confronts there a man of great education, a man of great learning, a man of great responsibility and he climbs up into his chariot alongside him. He overhears him reading the scriptures. He's reading the 53rd chapter of the prophecy of Isaiah. And he turns to him and he said, do you understand what you're reading? And in effect he said, I haven't a clue. Who's this guy talking about? Is he talking about himself or is he talking about some other? And beginning at the same scripture, he preached unto him Jesus. In the very next chapter, the ninth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, Saul of Tarsus, as he then was, posed this question. When he fell from his steed to the dust of the road to Damascus, he looked up into heaven and he saw the risen Christ and he said to him, Who art thou? And he answered the question for himself, Who art thou, Lord? We can go back into the Old Testament scriptures. We can see that glorious picture that Isaiah paints to us in chapter 63 of his prophecy as he sees the Christ, the servant of Jehovah, come in from the tomb. Who is this that cometh forth from Bosra with dyed garments? He that hath trodden the winepress alone. But my friends, Let's bring the question into the 21st century. Who is this? And if we put that question to our nation this evening, we would have a variety of answers. Answers that probably for most of us, if not all of us, would grieve us. In the ways that the Lord Jesus Christ is portrayed on the West End stage and the other great theatres of our world. The abuse that he suffers, the way in which he is demeaned, and the way that he is characterized, even in religious circles, as a man amongst men, as a prophet amongst prophets, as a preacher amongst preachers, as a savior amongst saviors. Not so very long ago, I was asked if I would conduct the funeral of my cousin's husband. I'd conducted my cousin's funeral only a few years ago, and now her husband had died. And I realized I was, to the best of my knowledge at any rate, I was conducting the funeral of an unbeliever. And I had many conversations with him. And when I posed to him and discussed with him the person of Jesus Christ, his stock answer was always this. He's only a man amongst men. He's one man of ideas amongst many men of ideas. And that, to be perfectly honest with you, is is the attitude of the vast majority of men and women when posed with a question, who do you say Christ is? Who is this? Is the way in which they will answer. Now, the great predecessor of Dr. Martin at Westminster Chapel was a man by the name of George Campbell Morgan. And George Campbell Morgan wrote these words. He says, uh, in effect, that a man's attitude to Christ is reveals what a man's thoughts of Christ really are. An attitude is an answer. A man's attitude to Christ reveals what a man's thoughts of Christ really are. And when we hear all these descriptions of Christ in in being placed amongst others, what is actually happening is this. Mankind is betraying what he really thinks of Christ. They don't see his uniqueness. They don't see his otherness. They don't see his saviour and his glory and his majesty. So the question itself demands of us an answer. And how is it that we can answer this question? Well, very, very simply, I want to give you three suggestions this evening. Because we can answer this Bible, this, this question from the Bible. We can answer this question as heaven has answered it. We can also answer this question as hell has answered it. And we can also answer this question as a man has answered it. Now the way in which heaven answers this question occurs on two occasions in St. Matthew's Gospel. You remember in chapter 3 that the Lord Jesus Christ is being baptised and as he comes up from the waters, a voice, an audible voice, 
is heard from the skies, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then in Matthew chapter 17, upon the Mount of Transfiguration, that same voice is heard. Peter, James and John, Moses and Elijah are there. And they hear the audible voice of God saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Now you would think, would you not, that that in and of itself would have sufficient strength to put at rest once and for all the answer to this question. After all, men have witnessed the fact that they have heard the audible voice of God speaking unto them from the skies. But the Apostle Peter, who was there on that occasion, makes a most remarkable statement. Because in his second epistle, and in the first chapter, he recounts for us how it was that he, being there with the others, upon that Mount of Transfiguration, heard that voice. And this is what he says. He says, we have not followed, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16, we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he, that is Christ, received from God the Father honour and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. And then he makes this most remarkable statement. He says, we have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto we do well that he take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place till the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in, in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, says Peter, Yes, I heard the voice. But I want to tell you something else. He says, what I am writing and what others have written, Old and New Testament alike, carries equal weight in affirming the truth, in answer to this question, what is it that heaven is telling us about this person, the Lord Jesus Christ? There is this audible voice but there is this authoritative voice, the voice of the scriptures. And what do they tell us in answer to this question? Now it's at this point I understand what Spurgeon says when he says eternity isn't long enough to preach on this subject. Because, my friends, when we come face to face with what the Bible tells us about the Lord Jesus Christ, we are dealing with vast vast subject a vast subject because it tells us in the first place that he is God's eternal son it tells us that he existed before time ever dawned before the earth in order stood or earth received her frame from everlasting he is God to endless years the same he was in the beginning that never begun he was with God, before time. Have you ever pondered that amazing thought? That there was a time when there was no time. And all there was, was God. I remember listening not so very long ago to a physicist being interviewed on Radio 4. And he said, we scientists have got a real problem. He says, the problem is, what was there before the Big Bang? And I yelled at the radio, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. You notice those verses I read to you by way of introduction this evening from Paul's letter to the Colossians. He is before all things. And by him all things consist. You see, the position of the Christian church is perfectly simple. The position of the Christian church is this. Christ alone is the Savior. And the reason for that is everything is of him. 
without him was not anything made that was made. And so when we're answering this question, who is this? This is this unique person, God, before all time. You remember that while he was here upon earth, he refers to it on many occasions. There were those Jews that, uh, that he was dealing with in John chapter 8, and they were boasting in Abraham being their father, etc., etc. You, you were of your father the devil, he says. Because before Abraham was, I am. In other words, I've always been. There has never been a time when I have not been because I'm the eternal son of God. And it is by him that worlds have been brought into being. You know, we've perhaps followed with some interest that man who's been in outer space for the last six months. And we've seen the pictures from outer space. And we see there the earth hanging upon what? Nothing. And we read the scriptures and what does it tell us? He upholdeth all things by the very word of his power. One slight deviation from its course, its orbit. Chaos. But he is the Christ who has not only made all things, but he is the Christ who sustains all all things. He is the Christ who made himself known through the Old Testament scriptures in a variety of ways. Comes to some of the patriarchs. He appears to Joshua as the captain of the, of the king of hosts. He comes to those dear men there in that fiery furnace in the book of Daniel. How many men did I put in the fire, says the king? Three. There's a fourth there. And he's like unto the son of of God. This was the one who the Old Testament scriptures told forth he would eventually come. Everything about him has been exactly fulfilled as the Old Testament decreed. The place that he would be born, the manner in which he would be born, of, of a virgin, etc. They all tell us of something of the uniqueness of this Christ. But not only is he God from all eternity, mysteriously and wondrously this is the God who became man, who took upon himself humanity. The word was made flesh, dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. We read of occasions when he knew what it was to be sorrowful. He wept. He knew of occasions when it, what it was to grow naturally. He grew in stature as a man. He knew, as is, we are told in, in John's Gospel, chapter 4 there, he knew what it was to hunger. He knew what it was to thirst. He knew what it was to need sleep because he was tired. Every frailty, every need of, human, of the human being is seen in this Christ. And although he is the Lord of all, and the cattle are upon a thousand hills are his by nature, he knew what it was to suffer the deprivation of poverty. Birds of the air of their nests, the foxes of their holes, the Son of Man. Nowhere to lay his head. But at the same time, during his earthly sojourn, we are told things that demonstrate to us that still he is God. We see his power over nature. We see his power over evil. We see men coming down and worshipping him. We see Peter answering and saying, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. His power over evil. And all of these things. What are they telling us? They're answering the question, who is this? He's God's eternal son who became flesh for us. But you know, quite remarkably, we are also told in the scriptures not only what the answer of heaven is, but we are told also what the answer of hell is. Because when we turn over to the very next gospel, in our New Testaments. We come to St. Mark's Gospel. We come to chapter 5. And we read there of a man. In the most tragic of circumstances. And situations. He's a man possessed. Of evil spirits. He's a man that not even chains can bind him. And that man. Possessed with these evil spirits. Comes face to face. With the Christ 
of God. And this evil that was within that man, in verse 7 of Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, cries out and says, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God, that thou torment me not. Earlier in that same Gospel, in chapter 1 and in verse 24, we have a similar situation. A man with an unclean spirit and the unclean spirits when they're confronted face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ saying what have we to do with thee thou Jesus of Nazareth art thou come to destroy us I know thee who thou art the Holy One of God now for once and for only once hell speaks the truth it's the place of lies he's the father of lies he's the deceiver and evil has come from his domain. But all the horrors of evil that possess those characters that we read of there in Mark's Gospel have to confess when they come face to face with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know thee. We know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Leave us alone. Don't disturb us. Don't make us uncomfortable abandon us leave us to our sin leave us to our darkness leave us to our depravity we revel in it we enjoy it we don't want you you see it is only the bible is it not that gives us the reason why it is that the world is as it is tonight my friends the mystery of sin as our forefathers called it man lives in rebellion against god he lives under the domain of the evil one the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them and you see evil and you see sin in all its horrors in the everyday affairs of life you see it demonstrated on the roads you see it demonstrated in some of the most atrocious acts that we see taking place the abuse of children, murder lies, adultery all the transgressions of the laws of God it's evidence to us of an evil force that is seeking to usurp itself and hold mankind in his sin and drag him down to a Christless and to a lost eternity but the evil forces themselves have to confess we know thee who thou art the Holy One of God you know like me I'm sure you meet very many people very sincere people I don't doubt and question for one moment. And you seek to engage with them and seek to speak to them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they say to you things like this, I believe. Listen, my friends, if you're one of those people tonight, let me tell you what the Bible says. The devil believes, but he trembles. He believes, but he trembles. And hell here is agreeing with the fact that year once in the history of mankind has come forth one who is able to conquer sin. The devils recognize him to be the son of God. But then we can answer this question in another way. We can answer it as many men have answered it in the scriptures. And there are some wonderful answers that are given to us in the Bible in response to this amazing question that was asked by all this the people of this city you can go back to your old testament scriptures and find some wonderful answers you can go for example to the psalm 73 whom have i in heaven but thee there is none upon earth that i desire beside thee my flesh and my heart faileth but god is the strength of my heart and my portion forever you can go to Solomon. Why Solomon? What does he say in response to this question? He says, he's the fairest of 10,000. He's the rose of Sharon. He's the bright and he is the morning star. You can come to the great apostle Paul after that experience of his upon the Damascus road, boasting in his own righteousness, etc. But when he became a Christian, what does he say? I count all things but dung but refuse that I might win Christ those two men on the road to Emmaus they spoke to Jesus not recognizing who he was and they say to him 
Have you not heard of the events in Jerusalem? The events concerning Jesus, a prophet, mighty in deed and in word. But let's just focus on the answer that Peter gives in response to this question. Earlier in chapter 16, verse 5, when Jesus posed this question, who do you say I am? Peter bursts out, as was his wont, and speaks on the behalf of the disciples and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, I, I think perhaps Peter is a man that most of us, if not all of us, can easily associate ourselves with because he's so inconsistent. He demonstrates all his frailty. He demonstrates all his sinfulness and his weaknesses and his inabilities. But he's also able to demonstrate tremendous strength, as was to be the case later in his life. He was a man who knew what it was to be, to be mastered by the forces of evil. Yet he still aspires to attain that unattainable good. And it's that's the man that says, Thou art the Christ. The son of the living God. What was he saying? In answer to that question. Well what he was saying in effect was this. Listen. You are the hope. Of the centuries. You are the promised Messiah. You are the deliverer for whom we've been waiting. You are the one in whom merges. The majestic might. And the meek mercy of a covenant keeping God. The covenant keeping God of Israel. You are the one that men has been sighing for, longing for, waiting for. The opener of the prison, the setting at liberty of such as are bound. The one for whom I've longed for and my people have longed for. You are the one. And you know when this man comes to write his brief epistles, he tells us more than enough concerning who this man is. This is the man, says the Apostle Peter, who was a lamb without blemish and without spot, went to the cross at Calvary and shed his life's blood. And concerning that blood, he was able to write in language like this, we are not redeemed with such corruptible things as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish, and without spot. He is the one who Peter tells us. Bore our sins. In his own body. Upon the tree. He is the one who has gone into heaven. What is, is at his father's right hand. Angels and authorities and powers. Are subject unto him. This Christ this meek babe of Bethlehem is now the mighty conqueror, is at his father's right hand, from the whence he will one day rise and come to the clouds and take his longing and his waiting people to be with himself. Now, I've been very brief tonight, but my friends, do you not get a sense of something in, of the way in which the scriptures answer this question for us? It's telling us. That the real answer to this question is not what men are saying in our present day and age, but confronted by the authority of the word of God, we realize the uniqueness, the otherness, the differentness of this person who is our Lord and is our Savior. Heaven, hell, this man agree. But the question is, what is your answer? Who is this Christ to you? Is he somebody who gladly you bow down and worship and adore and reverence with deep awe? The one you long to see in glory. The one who in willingness and obedience to his command and instruction you were able to celebrate at this table of remembrance this evening in partaking of, blood, of bread and of wine, which speaks of his body that was crushed and broken for us and his life's blood that was shed for the remission of sins. You see, the Bible is full of questions. We have looked at one that was asked 
at the very beginning of this last week of Christ's earthly pilgrimage as a man. At the end of the week, another man asked another question. And I leave it with you. His name was Pilate. What then will he that I do with Jesus, which is called the Christ? May God give to each of us grace to answer that question in the way that the Bible would have us so to do 